Yeah. You're making me angry. Oh, am I? Hello everyone! In this video we look at the transformation properties of scalars, vectors and tensors. A scalar, or more generally a scalar field, is a field that associates a single value to every coordinate point. Furthermore, this value must be independent of the choice of the coordinate system. That means that if we choose two sets of coordinates, x and x prime, then a scalar phi at the point x1, x2 must be equal to phi prime at x1 prime x2 prime, provided that x1 prime x2 prime and x1 x2 correspond to the same point. Examples of scalars in the real world are temperature, energy, pressure, and so on. Now consider a field where at each point we have two numbers, say v1 and v2, such that v1 is a value corresponding to the x1 axis and v2 to the x2 axis. V1 and V2 may be specifying the direction of the wind or the flow of underground water. Whatever the case, we can draw the two components V1 and V2 on the field itself and draw a new point where these components come together. The arrow connecting these points conveys the information of V1 and V2 in the form of length and direction. This is called a vector. If we change our coordinate system from x to x prime, the vector itself does not change, since the two points have not moved with respect to each other or the field. However, the components of the vector did change. Clearly, v1 prime does not have the same length as v1, and same is true for v2 prime and v2. Hence, the components of a vector are not preserved under coordinate transformation, despite the fact that the vector itself is. What about vectors on curved surfaces? Consider as an example the infinitesimal distance vector derived in a previous video on the covariant derivative. Link is in the description box. Recall the definition of the basis E. E1 is the partial derivative of the vector y with respect to x1. Similarly, E2 is dy over dx2. Since the vector y defines a point on a surface, and changing the coordinate system from x to x prime does not shift the point with respect to the surface, y is therefore preserved under coordinate transformation. Hence y of x equals y prime of x prime, where for brevity we let x stand for x1, x2, and same for x prime. Since the coordinate system x and x prime are equally valid, there must be a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. In other words, x can be written as a function of x prime and vice versa. Getting back to the bases. If in the coordinate system x the basis ei is dyx over dxi, then in the x prime coordinate system it is dy prime of x prime over dxi prime, or equivalently dy of x as a function of x prime over dxi prime. By virtue of partial differentiation, this is equal to dy of x over dxk times dxk over dxi prime, where k is summed over. We see that the bases are not preserved upon a coordinate transformation. This is not surprising. The bases always point in the direction of the local coordinate axes. So if the direction or scale of the coordinate axis change, so will the bases. Applying chain rule to the infinitesimal step dxi prime leads to dxi over dxk times dxk. We now have all the ingredients to find out how the infinitesimal vector ds changes under a coordinate transform.
In the prime coordinate system, ds prime equals ei prime dxi prime, which in terms of the unprimed e and dx equals to this. It looks like the vector ds prime is different from ds, which is disconcerting. After all, ds represents the distance between two points on a surface connected by a straight line and should therefore be independent of what coordinate system we choose. However, if we examine the expression in the parentheses more closely, we realize that it is equivalent to the Kronecker delta function, which is equal to 1 if k equals to q and 0 otherwise. To show this is not difficult. We know that dxi equals dxi over dxk prime times dxk prime. We also know that dxk prime can be expressed as dxk prime over dxj times dxj. Inserting the expression for dxk prime into the one for dxi, we get the following expression. Let's write out this equation component by component. In the first equation, we have dx1 on both sides, but also dx2 on the right-hand side. Since dx1 and dx2 are independent of each other, the only way this equation can be true is if this object is 1 and this object is 0. And same applies to the second equation, which leads to our original claim. Getting back to ds prime, we see that it is in fact equivalent to ds. As expected, ds is invariant under coordinate transformation. Notice that the transformation matrix of E prime has the unprimed coordinate in the numerator and the primed coordinate in the denominator. The converse is true for dx prime. Any object that transforms like E prime is called covariant. If it transforms like dx prime, it is called contravariant. To distinguish them, we use lowercase indices for the former and uppercase indices for the latter. Summing any convariant object together with any contravariant object produces an object that is invariant under coordinate transformation, whether they be a scalar, vector, or tensor. I will have more to say about tensors in a later video. Knowing the transformation properties of scalars, vectors, and tensors is important in many applications. For example, if you hypothesize that the tensor component Aij is proportional to another tensor component Bij, a quick way to check whether they are compatible is to look at how they transform. If one transforms covariantly and the other contravariantly, your hypothesis is wrong. WRONG! If they transform the same way, however, your hypothesis may still be wrong, but at least it has a chance.